years between the wars, radio became the first real means of mass communication. Radio was a diversion for the bored, a comfort for the lonely, and a lifeline for all those who felt frightened in the gathering darkness of the late 1930s. But once the war began, radio would become a powerful weapon in its own right, able to deceive and demoralize. It would use every combination of slander and suggestion, rumor and innuendo to damage morale and spread disaffection. The friend on the sideboard would become a potential enemy agent, threatening and bullying, frightening and persuading in turn. Dirty tricks. Four programs on the use of lies and deception in war with Peter Snow. Part three, the radio war. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling. Here are the Reichs and the Hamburg station Bremen and station DXB on the 31 meter band. You are about to hear our news in English. William Joyce, Lord Hawhaw. But Joyce's broadcast was the official voice of German radio. Everyone who listened to him had no doubt whose side he was on or where he was broadcasting from. But those who searched the airwaves for an escape from official BBC output on the one hand and Lord Hawhaw on the other might have come across something much more peculiar. You are listening to the new British broadcasting station operating on 5,925 kilocycles and on a wavelength of 50.63 meters. It is extremely provoking for any decent Englishman to think that our own social injustices have to be brought to light by hostile wireless stations. And it is partly for this reason that we have founded the new British Broadcasting Station. In future, it will not be possible for the enemy to say that nobody of the people in Britain has the courage or the energy to fight against the evils which the British people have to suffer. If the message and the delivery sounded slightly strange, there were good reasons. Although the new British Broadcasting Station pretended to be on the side of the British people, but against the government, this was the other face of German broadcasting to Britain. Black radio, a distinction explained by Professor Asa Briggs. But I think the basic difference between black and white remains relevant to this day. It, it is being used in various parts of the world now, clumsily or well, that in white propaganda, BBC propaganda to France, shall we say, or Germany, you say, we the British, mm. and you have to tell the truth, otherwise the British are discredited. In black propaganda, you say, we the Germans, mm. or if it's your broadcast to France, you say, we the French. And uh, it's a matter for your own judgment whether you mind uh, whether you're discredited or not. It, it in fact pays you to have a record of credibility. And I think the part that lying plays in uh, black is exaggerated. I think the important element in black is illusion. Unfortunately for the Germans' hopes, their new British broadcasting station never sounded genuine enough to British listeners. But the German black radio broadcast to France were much more effective and they helped speed the French collapse of the German invasion of May 1940. This was Blitzkrieg, a new and terrifying kind of war. Rumors spread like wildfire, and the flames were fanned by the German black radio stations. They called the Germans the hated Bosch, but they emphasized how fast the Bosch were advancing. They told listeners to lay in stocks of food and advised them to cash in their savings. The resulting panic emptied the shops and the banks. And they blamed the military defeat on German agents working behind the lines, the mythical fifth column, who never existed outside the broadcasts of German black radio, but who meant that any genuine French orders or information became deeply suspect. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Hitler? If you think we're on the run We are the boys who will 
stop your little game We are the boys who will make you think again Cause who do you think you are giving Mr. Hitler If you think old England done Though German black radio never really worried British listeners, the threat of the fifth column did. The main reason for the Home Guard was to have a force which could stop the fifth column spreading chaos behind Britain's defences. The real legacy of the new British broadcasting station's attack on British morale was to trigger a British black radio offensive against the Germans, an offensive much more sinister and much more effective than anything Goebbels and his team had been able to achieve. In fact, the Allied use of radio as a means of attacking the enemy goes back far earlier. John Keegan, defence editor of the Daily Telegraph. You get the very beginnings of radio war, for example, in 1914, when the French were broadcasting with a powerful transmitter from the Eiffel Tower in order to drown the radio transmissions of the various German army headquarters. It was only a trifle, but it was the beginning of radio war. This was the first time one side fighting a war had the chance to talk directly to anyone who would listen on the other side of the lines, to pass on propaganda, to intimidate, to deceive and to subvert, creating a whole new art which would be of increasing importance in the next great conflict. Michael Handel is Professor of Strategy and Policy at the US Naval War College. Where does he think the modern art of military trickery began? It should be tied to the rise of modern intelligence, which was a function of the appearance of radio, telephone, telegraph, and other more reliable sources of intelligence and communication, which could also be manipulated for the purposes of deception because you know that the other side listens. You can give him precisely what you want him to hear, and you can very carefully, if you monitor him, calibrate your deception to what he is doing. So the British turned to black radio with a station called Gustav Siegfried I, German signaler's code for the initials GS1. This could stand for General Stabs I, that's to say General Staff I, or Geheimsender I, Secret Transmitter I. It had the right mixture of secrecy and militarism, which its creator, the former Daily Express Berlin correspondent Sefton Delmer, wanted. He spoke the language like a native-born German, and he used a staff of anti-Nazis and ex-prisoners of war who'd served in the German forces and knew all the right jargon. Delmer's team, based at Woburn Abbey, decided GS1 had to pretend to be a secret station with its own inside information, strongly patriotic and pro-German, but just as strong in its criticism of the leadership and how the war was being fought. GS1's main speaker was Paul Sanders, a Berliner with an upper-class Prussian drawl who left Germany in 1938 and was serving as a corporal in the Pioneer Corps. All was ready for the first broadcast on May the 23rd, 1941, when Delmer's prayers were answered. Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, stole an aircraft and flew to Britain to try to negotiate a peace treaty. So GS1 was able to open with a powerful broadcast and also imply that the station had been broadcasting for some time. Now at last I can answer questions sent in after our last broadcast when I warned listeners that Hess was about to do something stupid. But this was bound to cause us problems. I had to order all my comrades to lie low while the investigations went on into how and why he had done it. Now, thankfully, the danger is past and we can speak freely again. First of all, let's get this straight. This fellow is by no means the worst of the lot. He was a good comrade of ours in the days of the Fry Corps, but like all the rest of this clique of cranks, megalomaniacs, string pullers and parlour Bolsheviks who call themselves our leaders, he simply has no nerves for a crisis. As soon as he learns the darker side of the developments that lie ahead, what happens? He loses his head completely, packs himself a satchel of hormone pills and a white flag and flies off to throw himself and us on the mercy of that flat-footed bastard of a drunken old Jew Churchill. And he overlooks completely that he is the bearer of the Reich's most precious secrets, all of which the f British will suck out of him as easily as if he were a bottle of Berliner Weisser. The tone was crude, but the message to listeners was clear and effective, even if it was dismissed as the oldest trick in the world by those involved with official white propaganda like the late Richard Crossman. 
It was simply a station purporting to be an obscene, blasphemous, pornographic SS man complaining about the iniquities of his people. One of Crossman's political colleagues, Sir Stafford Cripps, went even further in his dislike of GS1. Professor Michael Foote is a historian specialising in wartime clandestine operations. It was Sefton Delmar who invented the technique by which they got their audience, which was to be extremely scabrous, explaining in very minute detail what was happening to the wives and girlfriends of the chaps they were talking to while they were away on duty. Cripps is supposed to have heard one of these broadcasts by mistake and to have insisted on discovering that it came from a British source that it closed down, only with difficulty stopped from having the closed down. If Delmar's style was controversial, his timing was impeccable. His mention of the darker side of the developments which lie ahead was pure invention, but it was a shot in the dark which hit its target with deadly accuracy. Four weeks after GS1's first broadcast, on the 22nd of June 1941, listeners to official German radio heard that Hitler's armies had crossed the frontier to invade Russia. So this was what GS1 had meant. The station did have inside information and was telling the truth. This gave Delmer the credibility his station needed to do serious damage to German morale. Each item he used was based on genuine news items from official German radio, from German newspapers, or from the Enigma code-breaking operation, but subtly doctored to depress the spirits of those who listened. He was aided by the way the Germans released their news. Professor Foote. Goebbels, quite early on, back in the middle 30s, well before the war, laid down that twice a day his ministry was to broadcast to every German newspaper what, what they would say, which normally went out, a teleprinter. That, that, that was the twice daily um, teleprinter handout from the Ministry of Propaganda on which German newspapers were fighting. Nobody quite liked to tell him that there were one or two distant provincial newspapers which hadn't got a teleprinter. They were informed by RT. They continued to be informed by RT all on through the war. And of course, we heard it. That's where Delmar got all his very up-to-date stuff about the clock at Magdeburg having stopped at 10 past 7 or whatever it was. Delmer put these genuine news items, however trivial, to very good use. He created a scandal story, for instance, about Nazi bosses telling their wives to shop for their new winter coats ahead of the shortages created by the army's needs for warm clothing on the Russian front. The Germans were not the only ones deceived by Delmer's cunning. Richard Crossman. In running the black stations, he had his own stations, his own staffs, and he ran a whole series of stations purporting to be in Germany. So successful, by the way, that one of our greatest successes was that the Americans used to cable back from Berlin intact <laughs> everything the GS1 said as the latest information from inside the SS. And we had the pleasure of knowing that we were being blamed for not un for finding this secret information which they had straight from Woburn. <laughs> so it was quite an achievement. GS1 finally closed down after a full-scale Gestapo attack using the BBC sound effects department. The station went off the air. Sadly, as GS1 broadcast twice a night, the same recording went out later. This released the team for something much more ambitious. The Kurzwellensender Atlantique, or shortwave station Atlantic. A replica of a real German forces broadcasting station on the air daily and aimed at the U-boat service in its French bases. Nothing was spared to make the service convincing. Its signature tune was the U-boat Sailor's March, recorded for the station at the Albert Hall by the band of the Royal Marines. German hit records were bought in neutral Sweden and flown back to Britain in the bomb bays of mosquitoes. And the German-speaking announcer, Agnes Burnell, broadcast as Vicky, the sailor's sweetheart. My own record request programs were aimed at genuine people whose addresses we took from the letters of captured German soldiers. Once I broadcast the names of some party officials' wives who had bought up a lot of woolen goods in their local shops. 
If everyone behaved like this, I thundered, there would be nothing left for anyone else. A week later, the German papers reported a run on winter clothes which quite embarrassed the German economy. Another time, I announced that Allied saboteurs in SS uniform were dropped in a certain vicinity. As a result, all the SS men in the district set about arresting each other. The Nazis scoured Germany to track down the station. There were rumors it came from a barge on the Rhine, a cellar in Dortmund, a moving truck. Actually, we broadcast from a thatched cottage in Buckinghamshire, and later from Woburn Abbey. We were a small group, three girl singers, a pianist, and a sound effects expert from Hollywood. We gave them jazz, forbidden in Germany for its decadence, talks, and genuine news. The dedications were genuine too. A detailed card index on the small and close-knit U-boat community was built up from agents, decoded signals, interrogations of U-boat prisoners, and reading their letters home, and from German newspapers. If a record was played for a promotion, an engagement, a marriage, or a baby, the dates and names were genuine. When the station was finally revealed to be an allied black radio service, the effect was just as deadly. By this time, it ran all kinds of gossip about life in the U-boat bases, from football scores to inside jokes about real people and real events. To the members of that crew, knowing their only protection was in the secrecy of their whereabouts, the knowledge that the British knew exactly who they were and when they were leaving caused morale to collapse. Lieutenant Joachim Hunnefeld found Atlantic Sender's knowledge was uncanny. In late 1943, I was second watchkeeping officer on a U-boat, and we had a small sending off ceremony at the base where we were about to leave on patrol. That same night, within a few hours, there was a report, accurate down to the names of the officers who were present, including myself, on the Atlantic sender. It was supposed to be secret. How could they know? Allied convoy escorts found U-boat crews less willing to press home attacks. Interrogators at prisoner of war camps found newly captured U-boat men less reluctant to answer their questions, since they felt the British already knew everything. By this time, however, Black Radio was looking for an even bigger target. All the German armed forces in the West. And something much bigger was on the way to help them reach it. It shot up like a rocket till it nearly touched the sky. It's the biggest aspidestrian in the world. We couldn't see the top of it, it got so blooming high. It's the biggest aspidestrian in the world. The biggest development in black radio was a new medium wave transmitter called Aspidistra, because it was the biggest in the world. It was powerful enough to swamp genuine German stations, even inside Germany, and it was to carry a new black radio service, once again aimed at counterfeiting a genuine German forces station. It was called Soldatensender Calais, and it went on the air in mid-November 1943. For the remainder of the war, this would become black radio at its most powerful, helping to speed Germany's descent into chaos, as Richard Crossman admitted. He ended the war, of course, with a German forces program on a big medium wave station, running 24 hours a day, a total service for the German troops, much more attractive than they got from the, from the Deutschland sender, and giving them everything, including tips for malingering, uh, deceitful and news about the war, because of course, as Irma always knew, one must never mix truth and falsehood. Purely false is often truer than the truth. And therefore, he had the most gifted staff who had given this extraordinary job of subverting German morale under strict military discipline. In fact, Crossman was wrong in one crucial respect. What Delmer's team did so well was build their falsehoods on a solid framework of truth to make the seasoning of lies more believable. For example, news of Russian victories on the Eastern Front was, as listeners well knew, entirely genuine. But Soldaten Sender gave some reasons for German losses. New super weapons shipped from America, like phosphorus shells which pierced the thickest armor to roast anyone inside. Reinforcements from France were desperately needed. But Soldaten Sender explained that only the best and most efficient units could be considered for this sacred duty. So if your unit was sloppy and unprofessional, you could stay on in the peace of the French countryside. 
If it was smart and good at its job, then you were off to face the super weapons on the Russian front. Faced with that option, any advice on evading duty was doubly welcome. Oberstammführer Schmutzler owes his temporary laming to an old and infallible prescription. He tied a rubber eraser to the hollow of his knee at night so that it pressed hard against the nerve until the symptoms of general lameness were manifested, thus procuring his release from the army. Desertion was also encouraged. Booklets on faking medical symptoms were bound into hymn books, railway timetables and training handbooks and dropped all over Germany. So were kits to enable the user to run a high temperature or raise their blood pressure or even fog x-ray plates to gain a medical discharge. But for every soldier who tried to desert or be released on medical grounds, there were hundreds who really were sick. Now these would be seen as suspect deserters and sent back to duty, spreading discontent and disaffection. And for those really ill, possible infection in crowded billets and dugouts. The radio offensive was backed up by other, even dirtier tricks. When a wounded soldier died in a German hospital, a radio signal went to the local Nazi party office in his hometown for the news to be broken to his family. Allied monitors picked up the signals and soon the family would receive a letter on official hospital notepaper, apparently from the dead man's comrade, hoping the diamond brooch or gold crucifix which had been passed on through the party organization had reached them safely. The idea that Nazi party officials were robbing the families of dead soldiers was devastating enough. But soon the letters began to imply the soldier might finally have recovered, but was given a lethal injection to release the bed for a man who could be patched up to fight again. Rumors like these could never be repeated in public, so they could never be denied. When explosives were disguised as cowpats or horse manure, causing the Germans to see any patch of manure on the road as potentially lethal, these and other such tricks were cursed regularly on Soldatensender. Everyone knew all about them, along with German defeats and bomb damage to German cities in graphic detail. Small wonder that the master of German radio, Joseph Goebbels, confided to his diary the English poison transmitter Cali gives us much to worry about. The station does a very clever job of propaganda. And from what is put on the air, one gathers that the English know exactly what they have destroyed in Berlin and what they have not. The SS went even further. In 1944, an official in the Munich security headquarters reported on the damage being done by British Black Radio. The transmitter has caused the greatest unrest and confusion among the population by news concerning the situation at the fronts and at home. The population is showing ever-increasing trust in the station's news service, as its reports have shown themselves more or less correct. In view of the very grave effects of this enemy station from a morale and propaganda point of view, it seems very necessary to limit as far as possible the effectiveness of Calais. By this time it was easier said than done. The growing power of the Allied bombing offensive gave Delmer's team the chance to strike a new blow against the German home front. The Germans assembled refugees from areas threatened by the Allies at special rendezvous points. These plans changed so quickly they had to be announced over official German radio. But the official transmitters had to go off the air when Allied bombers approached, so the black radio team was able to take over the frequency. Speakers who could imitate the voices of the German broadcasters issued fake evacuation instructions. They ordered people to leave their homes. Nazi officials to close their offices and disband their organizations. They announced assembly points which didn't exist, telling people to meet trains which never ran. Fervent denials from German radio were met by strong counterclaims the very next time the official German radio went off the air as the bombers approached. The result was chaos. Even Richard Crossman, on behalf of the official white propaganda effort, felt moved to praise the contribution of Delmer's black radio organization. At the end of the war, he was allowed to have his news 12 hours before the BBC. Did Carlton Green like this? The answer was he didn't. But the military insisted, and therefore there was this extraordinary rivalry between the two. If you ask me which did more good, I have no doubt that in disintegration mm -hmm. of German morale, Black is extraordinarily powerful.
Well, now the Germans are dive bombing a convoy out into the sea. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven German dive bombers. Junkers 87. There's one going down on its target now. Bomb. No, he missed the ships. He hasn't hit a single ship. There are about ten ships in the convoy. No, well, we thought he got a German one had been got then, but now the British fighters are coming up. The struggle between attacking bombers and defending fighters involved different kinds of radio waves, carrying different kinds of message. But radio location, no less than radio transmission, was a fertile field of dirty tricks. Radio waves bouncing back off aircraft, giving an echo which could be used to find the range and bearing of the aircraft for the transmitter, were developed into what was first called radio location, later known as radar. Radar was a vital line of Britain's defences against the threat of massive German bombing. In fact, the Germans not only had excellent radars of their own, but also a system of radio beams to guide their night bombers to targets in England. The heavy raid on Coventry in November 1940 used these beam systems, systems which a scientific team was able to analyse from equipment found in crashed bombers, so they could be jammed. After that, German raids became much less accurate. But it took more than a year to develop a British radio beam system to guide our bombers to their targets in Germany. Professor R. V. Jones was head of Air Ministry Intelligence. The first of them was a system called G, which involved sending out three pulses from three different stations in, in Britain. And from the time interval between those pulses being received at any one point in a bomber, you could work out where you were. Well, it, it worked. And for the first time, there were British bombers flying over Germany who actually knew where they were, you know, within a mile or two. And that was absolutely revolutionary by comparison with what's been happening before. So much so that Bomber Command said, oh, this is jolly good. And they had only got, what, three, four aircraft, trials aircraft. And they said, oh, don't let's wait. Don't let's wait. Let, let's, let's use these aircraft, as the Germans have done, of its pathfinders to guide the rest. The problem was that one of the aircraft had been shot down. If the Germans now did what Jones's team had done and deduced how the system worked from what they found in the crashed aircraft, they could be ready to jam it from the start. Jones said as much to Sir Henry Tizard, chairman of the Air Defence Committee. When I painted this gloomy picture, Cizard said to me, do you think you could mislead them? And I said, well, I don't know, I'd have, I'm prepared to have a go. And Cizard said, you can ha have anything you want. Now, what a, what a marvellous offer to have all, all available national resources on the play of one big practical joke to deceive your enemy as to what it was he'd really got. First, they needed a cover story to explain the equipment carried in the bombers, but far enough from the real thing to mislead the Germans. Jones called his fake system J-beams. If any captured air crew mentioned G, the Germans would assume they were the same thing. He had the equipment labelled in a series belonging to beam systems like those the Germans had developed themselves, instead of pulse radar, which was really the basis for G. German agents, controlled by the British, reported conversations between RAF officers which showed how the system was based on beams, entirely fictitious. But Jones was convinced the Germans would be flattered by the enemy copying their system and would not look for any deeper explanation. Finally, he needed to give the Germans some more definitive evidence of this wholly imaginary system. Well, let us make some radio beams and set them up and call them J-beams and give the Germans something to listen to. So special J-beam transmitters and systems were built for setting up some beams, which, of course, we, did, we had no real serious intention of using. These fakes kept the Germans off the scent of the real G signals. Meanwhile, the real G stations were given a dummy aerial mast to make them look like ordinary radar stations. So the Germans missed a golden opportunity to nip Bomber Command's new target-finding system in the bud. In fact, it worked better than anyone dared hope. 
thanks to the J-beam story, Jones's estimate of three months before G was jammed was comfortably exceeded. A similar problem arose over German U-boats in the Bay of Biscay. When British aircraft first started to find U-boats by radar, the Germans fitted a receiver to the U-boats to pick up the enemy radar pulses long before the aircraft could see the U-boat on its screen. Now the RAF was using high-frequency radar, which these receivers couldn't detect, for the time being at least. And of course the U-boat losses went up dramatically at that point. Again, the problem was one of deception, because although the equipment which used a 10 centimeters wavelength uh, worked very well, it was identical with one that Bomber Command was using over Germany, which was being captured by the Germans, of course, from crashed aircraft in relatively large numbers. And it should have been flaming obvious to the Germans that it was the same equipment put into an aircraft would detect U-boats at least as well as would detect towns. And the problem was to try and keep them off the idea that we were using this new centimetric radar by using some alternative channel or observation. My own particular contribution was to persuade, the, try to persuade them, again, by using MI5's bogus agents who were in contact with Air Force officers and so forth, that we would detect them by infrared, infrared radiation. And that undoubtedly worked because one of the German U-boat commanders and, uh, and there are other descriptions in some of the records uh, of them holding conferences to hold, and favoring infrared as the means by which we were detecting them. And that even went so far as them inventing a beautiful paint which would camouflage the U-boat to look just like the same by infrared as it did by visible light. It was a beautiful technical job. I, I, I couldn't help admiring the man who, who did it. As the radio war tilted against the U-boat crews, it was also tilting against the RAF bombers, facing an array of radar-guided anti-aircraft guns and night fighters in the skies over Germany. Yet one simple weapon, a cloud of metallized strips to reflect the radar waves in the same way as a bomber, could paralyze the whole German defensive system. So they found it difficult to tell which was the real bombing raid and where it was aiming for. On top of that, there would be a whole gamut of radio countermeasures trickery. Former RAF air crew officer, Dr. Alfred Price. You would have fake orders being sent to the German night fighters over the radio from monitoring stations in England. Everything was being done here to raise the level of confusion. And in a combat situation, the level of confusion is great anyway. So sometimes, just a little bit more can make all the difference. Last moment, you're tuned in to German Officer's Service in Berlin, broadcasting to North America. There is the German Officer's Service in Berlin, broadcasting to North America over stations in the 19, 25, 28, 31, and 41 meter bands, which correspond to the 15, 11, 10, 9, and 7 minute cycle bands. The world today is divided into two camps. On the one side, Bolshevism. On the other, the defenders of civilization. Why is America still in the wrong camp? And now we bring you a list of names of American aviators who are prisoners of war in Germany. The first name, Fred Dale Gillogley, Jr. That name can also be Gullogley. It's spelled that way in the home address. First Lieutenant Fred Dale Gillogley, Jr. or Gullogley, G-I-L-L-O-G-L-Y or G-O-L-L-O-G-L-Y. Home address, Mr. Fred D. Gullogley, 445 South Brainerd Avenue, LaGrange, Illinois. Service number 0661-827. Second name, John Allen Brown, Jr. Second Lieutenant John Allen Brown, Jr. Home address, Mrs. Pauline W. Brown, 530 Chestnut Street, Sunbury, Pennsylvania. Service number 0731. 
0-15. Daniel Dolinka. Daniel Dolinka. Sta Staff Sergeant Daniel Dolinka. D-O-L-I-N-K-A. Home address, Mrs. Rose Dolinka, 862 Barham Street, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Service number 16-041-955. And the last name, Lyle Van Edwards. Top Sergeant Lyle Van Edwards, E-D-W-A-R-D-S. Home address, Mrs. Lyle V. Edwards, 1460 East McKinley Street, Phoenix, Arizona. Service number 38-003-022. We have just brought you a list of names of American aviators who are prisoners of war in Germany. This is Germany calling. And now we come to our next feature, which is for our feminine mistakes especially. And that is Mitch at the mic. Lazy day at home, a lazy day 
when spring and summer meet, a lazy day, when green fields are whispering of home sweet home. And now here it is, conveying all the thoughts in the hearts of those men so far away from their mothers and wives today. No longer lower me. The town just doesn't look at that. Thank you. 